mission creep, if I'm right in this definition, is that your mission then uh, becomes bigger than what the original mission was. Yeah. He yeah. can be taught. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome everyone to The Scuttlebutt. Welcome back. This is our second season, first episode. I'm your host, Sean Hall, the Director of Programming with the Veterans Breakfast Club. We're a small nonprofit in Pittsburgh, PA, and our mission is to create communities of listening around veterans to connect, educate, heal, and inspire. Uh, we've been off for about a month and a half. We've been reworking the organization. We're actually rolling out to be a nationwide organization for veterans, not just Pittsburgh based. Um, so we have a little bit of a new logo. We have a little bit new programming coming up soon. And uh, we hope that you're going to join us here for the scuttlebutt this season. We're going to sort of let our hair down a bit. I'm not wearing a button down anymore. I kind of like the hoodie look uh, if you're watching on YouTube. Um, but uh, we created the scuttlebutt because we wanted to help bridge that military civilian divide and bring you information about the military, talk about military topics, and we hope that uh, you'll take the opportunity to connect with us and ask us questions about the military. We'd love to answer any of those. Uh, please uh, like, share, subscribe, ring the bell on YouTube. Uh, if you want to email me, you can do that at Sean with a U at veteransbreakfastclub.com. Uh, you can leave a comment on YouTube. You can leave a comment on TikTok. We're across all the social medias, um, and we'll definitely call it out here on the podcast. Um, joining me for episode one today of season two are Karen Sudcamp and Ryan All. Uh, thank you both for joining us. I like give it, I would give you guys a, a minute to, to introduce yourself, give us a little bit of your background. You've both joined us before, but for our new viewers, I'm sure it'd be a, a nice uh, introduction. Karen? All right. Hi, I am Karen Sudcamp. Um, it's great to be back here. Um, I spent 12 years yeah, I have to go back and think about it. Um, 12 years as a civilian um, intelligence analyst for the Department of Defense, um, you know, starting in 2004 and, you know, just had a grand old time working for, for the department um, and working with the military. Um, and I still do national security research um, here in Pittsburgh as well. So that's a little bit about me. Awesome. Thanks. And Ryan? Hi, my name is Ryan All. I am a Army veteran. I enlisted uh, in 2002, right after the 9-11 uh, attacks. I did two tours in Iraq as an infantry soldier. And when I came home, I, I went to the dark side, and now I'm a logistics officer. <laughs> to the dark side? Why do they call it the dark side? Well, the officers are... You know, ah, it's a thing. It's a see, thing. I'm still learning. Um, well, this episode today, uh, we're actually going to title this episode 9 11 at 20. So, sort of a running theme, uh, throughout the year, uh, not only for this podcast, but for the VBC. Um, we will be starting a new program that I will be hosting called Generation 9 11 at 20. Uh, it's an opportunity for us to talk to post 9 11 veterans about their stories, their experiences. Um, and we're going to contextualize 9 11 a bit. Uh, you know, it's part of my generation. Um, you know, we all remember uh, when it happened, where we were when it happened. We're going to talk a little bit about that, but we want to talk about how it changed the world, how it changed people's lives. What uh, did it make them want to enlist? Uh, you know, what were these decisions? Um, there's so many different questions that we can bring up uh, about and from 9 11, um, and not only just understand the history a bit more, because I think part of bridging that military civilian divide is that um, a lot of people know, yes, we have troops out there, uh, but where are they? And, and we know that they've been in Afghanistan and Iraq, but there's many other places as we're going to get to that our troops have been that are doing counterterrorism uh, operations. Um, but we also have many bases that are just around the world uh, that a lot of our troops are stationed in. Um, we're going to start with an easy one today. And once we get to that new segment, but we hope that you'll join us for the live program, which will be Generation 9-11. That'll be Thursday nights on Zoom uh, at 7 p.m. Uh, I'm hoping that Karen and, and Ryan will come on those programs and, and join us and talk about uh, their service because, you know, that many decades of experience here, please, we, there's a lot of stories that we would love to hear and understand more about what it was like being in the military during the last uh, 20 years uh, of the, the global war on terror. Um, so... Today, yes, we're going to start with a new segment from uh, an article that was 2017, 2018 from the Smithsonian. I'm gonna share my screen so that you'll be able to see this. Uh, I'll pull this map up and it is an incredible map of 80 countries around the world that, here we are, uh, 
that the US has some involvement in. So you might take a second to sort of look at this if you're watching on YouTube to see uh, where all of these operations are happening. This is obviously mainly focused, we have a lot of focus on Africa, Middle East, uh, Europe, um, Australia, the Philippines, and, and some happening in there in South America. Um, blue stars are US military bases or what they quote unquote call lily pads. Uh, the yellow uh, target is training and assistance. The US military and or State Department um, trains or assists this country's security forces in counterterrorism. There's sort of a, a refresh, a green sort of recycle. Uh, it's US military exercises. This country has hosted US military exercises intended to deter militants, train local forces, and build strategic partnerships to combat terrorism. Uh, there's sort of like a burst effect. These red, red and white ones, these are for uh, actual combat that, that has happened in these countries. Uh, and then there's a, a red one that uh, has a, a top-down view of a drone, and that's actually where we have had air and drone strikes. Now, uh, Karen saw this uh, map before we started recording and she said, wow, like, you know, this is pretty incredible. Like, uh, who would have thought since 9-11? At 9-11, would we have thought, okay, we're going to war with Afghanistan 20 years later. Now we have this level of uh, activity uh, all around the globe. Um, but we wanted to start a little easier. So, uh, if you were to look at this and you were to dive into Libya, you, you know, you might get lost in the shuffle a bit, but if you were to look up into Europe and you say, okay, Germany, um, if we looked at Germany specifically, uh, Germany ha has been a vital part of the United States defense strategy in Europe ever since the end of World War II. So there's a long, long history there of why we have bases in Germany. Um, the US after World War II was a part of a 10 year allied occupation of the country under uh, an occupation, occupation statute. And when the military occupation of West Germany officially ended, the country regained control of its own defense policy. However, the occupation statute was succeeded by another agreement with, with NATO, uh, NATO allies. And this deal, known as the Convention on the Presence of Foreign Forces in the Federal Republic of Germany, was signed in 1954 by West Germany. It allowed eight NATO members, including the US, to have a permanent military presence in Germany. The treaty still regulates the terms and conditions of the NATO troops stationed in Germany today. Now, Though troop numbers uh, have fallen drastically since those days, uh, the U.S. military still maintains a major presence, and uh, and over the intervening decades, uh, the U.S. military communities have formed around a handful of German towns. So, you know, these bases uh, are pretty, they're large, right, Brian? Have you uh, been stationed, right, Karen, have you been stationed at any of those bases in Germany? I was gonna say, I have not been stationed at, but I have, you know, flown through or visited, you know, a whole host of them, you know, in Stuttgart, Ramstein, you know, are the most popular ones. Mm -hmm. um, so, but, but yeah, sadly have never, have never spent, you know, more than a, a couple of days or a week um, in Germany. What about you, Ryan? So, no, I, I have personally never been stationed there, but I, I was a military brat and my, my father was stationed in Europe a few times uh, and he was in the intelligence community as well. So some of those places you mentioned like Rammstein and Stuttgart where, you know, headquarters of, of a lot of uh, European intelligence agencies are, are, are there. So, um, yeah, they're, they're massive bases that are, you know, very well entrenched and very, very much built up over time. And there was actually a, a time a few years ago where they actually reduced the amount of U.S. forces in Germany. Um, moving like parts of the 1st Infantry Division who had been there for a very long time from Germany to uh, Fort Riley, Kansas. Mm -hmm. So the the troop level in, in Germany, I, I believe, has overall gone gone down. Um, over yeah, the I believe it's about 38,000 roughly is the number of troops we have there. Yeah, still a very large number, mm -hmm. um, but it used to be larger. When, and when you think about the the global, you know, situation, over the Cold War and things like that makes sense that the troop levels in Germany would be very high in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Yeah. Um, whereas now, where our troops have been utilized and being needed in other places in the world, they're you know they're sent to, to other locations. And it's a good place for I mean, whenever we send troops over into the Middle East, that's maybe a good halfway point. Like you, you can you can sort of shuffle the deck a bit whenever you get uh, if you have bases that are sort of the midway point. I would assume. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and so. 
uh, obviously also you don't see on this map like South Korea, you don't see Japan. Now that's because this map I believe is is based specifically, they, they uh, specifically made it for counterterrorism operations. Not that maybe those other countries have counterterrorism operations going, uh, but they they uh, focused in on these specific countries for this purpose. And uh, you know we're gonna do our research and take a look at uh, other countries where we have bases uh, and see why those bases are there as well. Um, Cause obviously we have, um, Germany has uh, the most number of, of American troops other than Japan. Um, so we have two areas that, that we can definitely take a look at. And Germany is home to five of the seven U.S. Army garrisons in Europe. The other two, I believe, are in Belgium and Italy. Are you familiar with the term mission creep, Sean? <laughs> mission, mission creep? That sounds like I, I understand the word creeping. So is this the same thing, just I'm mission creeping? You're, so mission creep is a, is a term used when uh rather whether intended or unintended the the mission that you started with continues to grow and grow and grow until at one point it's now kind of unrecognizable from the initial mission okay. but all of the you've taken all of these actions to you know further uh try to accomplish your initial mission but it then it just becomes it kind of grows out of hand i find it interesting that on this map they're using you know that they're highlighting South America, which, you know, does that mean that they're wrapping in the counter narcotics fight? Like when I think of CT and counterterrorism, we generally think of it as a fight against Islamic extremism. Mm -hmm. um, but like, even within the military, at least in my experience, the counter narcotics fight is still in many ways, very separate from the counterterrorism fight. Um, except in a couple of different places like Afghanistan, you know, they kind of merged together, but- Because of Poppy? Because of Poppy, but they're mm -hmm. still, you know, they're still thought about in, you know, kind of very separate silos, um, predominantly because for the military, CT operations are still predominantly focused on um, kill capture type of missions. It's an interesting thing for us to sort of dive into if we're going to help um, educate our audience a bit on the military and where they are and where they're going and where they could potentially go. Uh, it's a good way to look at a map and say, oh, okay, so we have kind of presence everywhere. And if we're working to counter counteract terrorism uh, globally, uh, well, well, that's the global war on terror, right? Yeah. Pretty straightforward. Yeah, I think um, one of the things that we that we brought up, right, like, I think Karen's point was was great. Like, if you thought about the world 20 years ago when 9-11 happened, would you really think that we would be in all of these places? Um, I think if you ask the average American, right, like, they probably wouldn't realize the level of presence that we have just in the continent of Africa, right? That's the first thing that popped out to me when I looked at that map was like, wow, like, almost the entire continent is covered with something. Mm -hmm. Most things are gray on that, on that piece of the map, which is... Um, uh, even a little bit surprising to me. And a question about that. So uh, as we look at all of the action happening in Africa, this isn't just we drop off some troops and they set up, you know, a, a defensive position and that's it. Like we probably have a lot of diplomacy happening, um, intelligence work happening. There's probably work with the government's agencies, uh, embassies. This is a, a, a big a big machine with a lot of gears moving. It's not just like one operation. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, I I would definitely agree with that. I mean, I think, you know, on the one hand, you know, I think about how a couple of years ago um, there, you know, there were the the special forces who were supporting um, their uh, in Niger. I think it was, and everyone was surprised of. You know why were U.S. troops there? What were they doing? You know, we're working with with their partner forces, um, but you know, so there there are those incidences instances. But I mean, also at the same time, going back and looking at the map, you see like South Africa, and that I think, if I'm remembering correctly, um, with the icon of security and assistance training, like that's been you know, I'm assuming because I, I'm not deeply familiar with that relationship, that that has been going on forever. And so that there is some sort of, you know, course or incident, you know, some sort of, you know, 
training partnership that's been ongoing and there's an element of counterterrorism, you know, focus to it, but probably not the entire relationship. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's also um, important to keep in mind on some of these as well. So it's, it's something that just sort of continues to get bigger the more you dive in. Um, Ryan mentioned a story about uh, having a large operation to capture four financiers. Um, and you got them, but then I think the, the next question is, uh, what did that lead to? And, and did, did mission creep then expand bigger because the information you were able to gather from these financiers led you to four, five, 10 different new people or new places that you had to take a look into? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I can't uh, accurately answer that question. Um, I was, uh, I was a, a young infantry soldier for that mission, right? But I, I do remember it very, very vividly. Um, uh, but uh, the, you know, the, the objective of that mission was to, to not, you know, take down, you know, fighters or, or bomb builders. Um, our mission was to, to catch these four guys who were funding those people. And it was a very large operation. And, and, you know, we, we do these things called tactical site exploitations, which is after the, after the fight is over, um, the, the real, you know, value that we're looking for is the intelligence pieces. Um, mm -hmm. We are looking to find where our next target is going to be. We're looking to find out uh, who's all involved and who do these people know. And this all gets fed into this massive intelligence uh, machine that, that Karen, I'm sure can talk uh, a lot more about than I can, but I understand that, you know, it, um, we need to find out who these people are connected to and, and where they are and what are they doing. And, and one piece of information, which may seem uh, unimportant, you know, when you bring it into this database and see, you know, who is all connected to those pieces, then it, then it forms a, a more accurate picture of, of what is going on um, so that we can kind of lift the, the veil a little bit and, and see into that world and, and how it operates. And as you can see from the map, um, uh, it's a very, you know, large organization, a large undertaking. And, uh, you know, we, we, you know, in the, in the military, on the military side of things, we're, we're given a mission and our job is to accomplish those missions. And it's only at the very kind of high levels where you, where you're involved in these, you know, policy making decisions about where uh, and why we're going to these places. Yeah. Building off of what Ryan was talking about. And, and when he mentioned the, you know, post-operation, you know, tactical exploitation, you know, in my mind, I'm thinking docx or document exploitation, or there's, you know, a whole host of, you know, terms of like pocket litter of like, you know, seeing what's, you know, what a particular, um, you know, person had had, you know, in his pockets, you know, what was on his phone, kind of all of those things. But then that reminded me of, you know, A, yes, there's a lot of intelligence value potentially in, in, in all of those things. But it also reminded me just how much of, you know, the network matters. Um, General Stanley right. McChrystal, um, he's written a lot about this. But one of the things that he did with, um, with, uh, with his special operations units that he was in charge of uh, and would like to say was that you need to have a network in order to defeat a network. And I think a lot of people, um, I would say a lot of people don't necessarily understand, you know, the importance of A, understanding the enemy network, but B, then also having just this incredibly um, large network of, of your own allies and partners. So whether it's in the United States government, but also working with your other countries, other allies, um, you know, those networks are just as important. And so, mm -hmm. um, so while there has been just this massive expansion over the past 20 years, it also just goes to show just how intricate all of the different levels of networks are and how important they are um, in the counterterrorism fight. Totally. I was going to do uh, a, a different phrase of the week it's part of one of the segments i love from season one but but mission creep i think uh took the top spot so that's our that's that's our term for the week is is mission creep uh meaning if i'm right in this definition is that your mission then uh becomes bigger than what the original mission was yeah he yeah. can be taught 
<laughs> he can be taught. We want to uh, jump over to our quick headline um, segment here and just uh, make reference to a YouTube uh, channel. The National Museum of the U.S. Air Force has a drone fly through of um, of their museum. Uh, we'll put the link up in uh, the video here. Go over and check it out. It's a great HD view of their museum for people who can't get out uh, during COVID. Uh, it's a good opportunity to sort of uh, see the museum from a bird's eye point of view. Um, it's really interesting. Um, came across that. But one other thing that I wanted to, to highlight, and this was one of the big headlines that I saw come out of the past week, is that the newly elected president signed an executive order lifting the previous administration policy that largely banned transgender individuals from joining the military. I thought this was a, an important uh, thing that, that we should highlight here on the scuttlebutt. Um, Emma Shin, a Marine Corps captain who serves as uh, president of Service Members, Partners, Allies for Respect and Tolerance for All, or SPARTA, one of the cooler acronyms I think I've read, uh, said, I am elated that the approximately 15,000 transgender service members proudly serving across the globe can rest easier knowing that their service to our nation is seen, valued, and that they can continue to serve as their authentic selves. And the newly confirmed Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin told the Senate Armed Services Committee, I truly believe that you're fit, if you're fit and you're qualified to serve and you can maintain the standards, you should be allowed to serve. Um, I just wanted to highlight that, that headline coming to us from military.com. I wanna jump over to our main story because uh, you know I think you could make up six episodes for the amount of story that is involved in any one of these questions. But I wanted to start off uh, asking you both uh, about where you were on 9-11. We do hear that question a lot. And I think it's a question I'm going to ask a lot over the course of this year, um, because I think that that changed a lot of people's lives. And uh, I remember exactly where I was at and what happened that day and what happened that night. And, you know, I can't remember what I had for breakfast, but I know exactly what happened during those hours. Um, so, uh, Ryan, let's let's start with you. If, if you remember where you were and and how that changed your worldview. I was in sociology class in high school when that happened. Uh, and I remember we were sitting there and my uh, history teacher just popped his head into the room and said, you might want to turn on the television. And the, the teacher turned on the television and about, and we, we saw the one flaming tower and about, we were probably watching it for maybe a minute, 90 seconds or so. And then the other tower got hit. And I just remember having this, massive realization that like okay it's obvious that that was not an accident right Two, two. this happening twice is, is not an accident and then I got this like dread like history was my thing right I remember like all of these you know like I just had this uh this feeling of that this is how this is how war start this is going to start a war and you know obviously you know I was right I mean it didn't take a, a huge amount of intelligence to, to connect those dots but you know, it was just this kind of feeling of, of dread uh, a bit um, um, and, and, you know, anxiety and, and fear of the unknown. But most I was just had this overwhelming like sense of sadness, not only for like what was happening to those people in those towers, but also like what th uh, this feeling of sadness over what was going to come. Mm -hmm. And at that point, had you already thought about enlisting? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I was going to okay. be I was going to be in the military. 100%. So uh, that, that had always been like a life goal of mine. How did the other people in the class, did they, did they know you were going to be enlisting? How were they reacting to that moment? Well, mostly, most, mostly it was just, you know, shock. And mm -hmm. you know, it, it did capture everyone's attention. That's, that's for sure. Right. And no one really talked for a while. No one knew what to say. No one knew, knew what, what to do. Um, it was, yeah, it was a very, you know, momentous occasion that I think had an impact on everyone there. Were you uh, in the ROTC program or were you planning to enlist like straight out of high no, school? I was, I was planning on enlisting. Okay. Um, and then, you know, very shortly after that, about 11 days after my 18th birthday. Um, so September 11th uh, occurred. I turned 18 that January and on February 11th, I enlisted. And what did your parents think? Like 9-11 happened. They knew you were probably going to enlist. Uh, were they supportive after the attacks and knowing that, okay, there's, you know, we're already going to war and uh, you're going to be going to be joining? Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, my, my father was in the military and I, I think that he understood there, there was no, there was no talking me out of it. And I think I've mm -hmm. talked about this on some, some BBC things before, like he actually had thought I was like drafted into the infantry 
<laughs> you didn't realize that I had volunteered, you know, for the <laughs> which the draft ended in what seventy six. <laughs> yeah, like he just uh, he had been a, he had been a recruiter at one okay. point in his career, and uh, when I took my ASVAB and I scored very high, um, he he like in his mind he was like, "There's no way that my son chose the infantry with that ASVAB score." So he just figured like the army just needed infantrymen, so they just put me in there. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it was, you know, it was, wasn't until a few years later that I, that I broke the, the truth to him that, no, I, I chose the infantry, you know, that's what I wanted to do. Um, and that's not to say, that is not to say that there are dumb people in the infantry. Some of the smartest people I've ever met in the military are in the infantry. A lot of people choose the infantry. It's, mm-hmm. it's what, what they want to do. A lot of the best people, uh, um, choose to do that because that's, that's what they, that's what they want to do. Um, it is, it is, you know, that is where the rubber meets the road. Something tells me you're, you're going to be a bit of an outlier in from this question in the sense that uh, a lot of people maybe chose to enlist after 9-11, feeling a sense of patriotism, feeling a sense of like, you know, uh, I, I want to go and protect my country. Since you had already had the feeling of en- enlisting prior to uh, 9-11 happening, um, it, that... That, so it, it just it just reinforced that feeling of like okay it's go time is that correct? Yeah, I think probably the the biggest influence um, was uh, my father had done a, a twenty some odd year career in military intelligence, and that's mm-hmm. what I had originally planned on doing was doing military intelligence. Okay. So I would say probably the biggest influence that that had on me was was uh, was switching to uh, to be an infantry soldier because that's I wanted to be on the front lines of, of what of whatever was happening. So that's, I would say that's how 9-11 probably influenced my military decision the most. Did you, how did you see the world change? Uh, you know, obviously we were all kind of like young, we were all like 18. We didn't really maybe understand the, the world all that much, but was there a sense that uh, the world got more serious to you? Yeah, I think for sure. Um, it definitely got more serious, I think. Um, I had grown up traveling quite a bit. So I think the, the most practical thing that I saw change was like traveling, like what happened in airports, right? Mm-hmm. And, um, the, the huge um, surge in like patriotism, right? The amount of, the amount of people who were willing to, you know, to rally around uh, the United States flag um, because of what had happened now that we had a, an, an external enemy. Um, you know, uh, geopolitically, um, you know, I, I can't speak too much about about that. Uh, as I said, I was only like 17 when it happened. So I didn't have a huge grasp on like what was happening. So for my own personal view, um, you know, I just kind of uh, was was viewing it in the in the portion of, uh, of, you know, what had always been a rocky uh, and violent, you know, area of the Middle East. And how was this going to, to change all that? And the attention went right there. And then, you know, and then to Afghanistan, um, which, you know, I, I had no idea other than uh, a, a cursory knowledge that Russia had been in a big war in Afghanistan, mm-hmm. nothing really about Afghanistan. And now it's the center of, you know, essentially our foreign policy is what's going to happen in Afghanistan. So I think right. that's a big, a big change. I remember two days prior to 9-11, I walked into a 7-11 and I looked at the, the, the newspaper that was there and uh, it said something about... Um, uh, tensions rising between the U.S. and Middle East, or something, and um, I don't remember the exact headline, but I do remember. I do remember specifically thinking, "Boy, it would be really terrible for us to have to go to war over there." And then 9/11 happened, and it was just like, "Well, now it's like, no, we have to." Um, but uh, Karen, I'm going to shift over to you and, and ask you the same question: Is where were you, and and how did you? How did your worldview change after 9/11? So I was a sophomore in college. Um, I had just started my my second year at Georgetown in DC. Um, and I was in class when everything happened. I had an 850 um, philosophy class. Um, and I remember, it's weird how we talk about the things that we remember because I remember like, walking out of my apartment door and it closing behind me and kind of standing on the stoop for a moment and it was this beautiful fall day like the most gorgeous blue sky like all of those things and I remember just taking a moment and thinking of like how beautiful it was and how great of a day it was going to be and the year was going to be you know all of those things and so I was in class for all of it I didn't know anything had happened until wow. after. 
Um, because I then had a class that started at 10, 15, um, ironically, Middle Eastern civilization. It was a history class and I walked in and it was kind of a, a large, just large lecture. And it was just me and my roommate sitting in there and we were like, what is going on? Another student walks in and is like, did you hear that an airplane hit the Pentagon? And I was like, what on earth are you talking about? Like mm -hmm. this, no, like what on earth? Um, and at the time, you know, 2001, no one had a smartphone. So, but we had like computers outside in the hallway. And so I went to go check because, you know, planes don't hit the Pentagon. Mm -hmm. um, and, and like nothing was loading up. And at that point, I just started to have like this great fear, like building of like, what is going on? Um, by the time I made it back into the room, my, my professor walked in and was like, considering the, uh, you know, the events of the morning, like classes canceled and kind of all of those things. Um, and as I ran back across campus to like, find the television, like what's going on. I ran into a friend of mine who was in ROTC um, and had actually seen the plane like fly into the Pentagon wow. um, on his way back to campus that morning. So, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so that, that was kind of my morning. I also had this element of, of fear because much like Ryan, my dad was also in the military. He was still serving at the time. My my parents and my younger sister had just moved from a tour in Japan to Offutt Air Force Base, which is in Omaha, Nebraska, the home of Strategic Command. Um, it has a long Cold War history of, of being the home for all of our strategic bombers. And there's a lot of, um, a lot of people with, um, with nuclear nuclear background and expertise there and, and all of those things. My dad was a submariner, um, which is weird when you're living in Nebraska, but that's a whole other story. Um, and so I had grown up with this whole, like knowing and being told of like, you know, the terrorists, you know, the terrorists really know like what the important things to hit. And it's not just necessarily the bases, but like housing and everything. So I had like all of these scenarios running through my head, you know, at 19 years old being like, oh my God, you know, this is a really important place. Um, and so then trying to like get in contact with, with my family was really important. Which took and a while that day, that, that day, everything yeah. was, yeah. Yeah, that day was, was pretty intense, including like, my mom had been out running errands. So like I left all of these messages on, you know, the machine and anyway. Yeah, um, yeah. And so, but for me, it really did not change my, my perspective or, or my, or my focus. Um, you know, as I mentioned, I had been sitting in my Middle Eastern history class. Like I already had an interest in the Middle East um, which was the result of, of moving around and being able to travel um, as a child. Um, mm -hmm. We were living in Italy in the early 90s. And so um, we actually visited Egypt when I was in fourth grade. And I was just absolutely fascinated by this country and the people and the culture. And that just kind of set me along this path of wanting to know more and to be able to travel there and and all of those things so you know i i was pretty or i was already committed to the you know learning about the middle east and studying it and hopefully being able to work there um you know my original plan was to was to actually become a diplomat and go into mm -hmm. the state department um and when that didn't work out um I knew that I still wanted to work for the government. I knew that I did not want to join the military, um, but I knew that I wanted to work, you know, in the government and continue to serve um, in that aspect. And so, you know, that's how, that's how I ended up in the intelligence community. Did being in, in Washington, um, 
boy, that, that had to feel there. I mean, being in Pittsburgh, obviously it was a very, it was a different feeling. Um, but I would think that being in DC proper was probably a, a bit more intense. It, it was, and because there was so much unknown, like I had friends who were interning on Capitol Hill that day and, you know, had been evacuated. I could see the plume of smoke coming from the Pentagon from the rooftop of my apartment. Mm -hmm. Like just the, the city, I could imagine, you know, friends of mine who are, who are currently in DC at the moment, I haven't talked to them about this, but I feel like the lockdown that DC went into after 9-11 was very similar to the lockdown that they've been experiencing over the past couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. And um, there was just this, you know, the bridges were closed, everything like, and there was just this sense of, we don't know what comes next, just kind of this horror. And, you know, particularly if you've ever flown into, into DC, into Reagan National Airport, you know, it follows the Potomac and you fly right over Georgetown mm -hmm. and, you know, while annoying being in the flight path after a while, like you're used to seeing and hearing the planes come in. And since national was closed for like a good six months or so after the silence was just so eerie and disconcerting mm -hmm. right. that yeah. it, it just fed into all of this unknown and what comes next. And um, yeah, like in you know as as we keep talking about it's still this very clear and defining you know day and moment and experience did you uh experience um the world changing a bit there did did like your classmates did they uh did some of them say okay i'm going to continue on this route or someone said you know i, I i'm out like i can't there was i do remember like there was this a lot of people all of a sudden it seemed like we're a lot more interested in the Middle East and terrorism mm -hmm. and um, classes, you know, more classes were, were popping up and, and all of that. But I mean, kind of being at Georgetown, you had a pretty wonky population of, of college kids anyway, mm -hmm. who, you know, you know, particularly for me, um, you know, there's multiple colleges at Georgetown and I was in the School of Foreign Service. And so a lot of us already were focused on, you know, on these careers, whether it was for government or internationally focused or being aware. So um, a lot of us kind of already came in with ideas of where we wanted to be and what we wanted to do. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I don't think it scared a lot of people. I think it, um, in terms of shying away from from their from their paths, I think um, I think it it probably just made more of us like myself just more determined to mm -hmm. to go into those realms. You know, I, you know what they say about assuming, and it's just <laughs> is that I I would assume most people that I would ask like, did nine eleven change the course of your life, and and if it hadn't happened, what would you have done differently? Um, coming into this, I, I think I, I'm assuming that most of my guests would ha say that, it, well, it changed the course of my life in this way, or, you know, I was going, you know, it drastically changed it to that. Um, but it, it seems like that question is, has already been answered with both of you is that you, you know, like Karen, you were already ready to sort of work in government and diplomacy. Yeah. And Ryan, though, you went from intelligence to infantry, there was still this already a drive of like, you know, I'm, I'm enlisting and that's what I'm doing. And this is, th this is the slight change that happened, but it didn't force me into a different, totally different life path. Yeah, I would agree. Kind of like with Ryan, like while I had, you know, the idea of working for government and, you know, there was the slight shift from, you know, diplomacy into intelligence, but also all, further on in the career than the shift into into terrorism and counterterrorism that I not entirely sure I would have necessarily gone down if mm -hmm. um, if 9/11 hadn't happened if there hadn't been active military operations in the Middle East like before mm -hmm. um, but kind of the the general structure of of my path yeah I think would have been pretty similar 
I'll, I'll ask this question and, and uh, it, it's an interesting thought that popped up it is, um, do you feel after we've looked at this map and, um, and talked about, uh, you know, sort of the paths that you guys were on and the fact that we're at 20 years after 9-11, do you still feel that counterterrorism operations are very important throughout the world, as important as this map definitely makes it seem? It's a tough question, I think. I'll, I'll throw in an answer in my head is that I feel like it's, I feel like it's still important as a civilian. I feel like it's, um, it, it maybe doesn't feel like it's as immediate as it was after 9-11, where we, we, we had just been attacked. It was um, a time that we uh, had to um, gather the troops and, and have a force ready to defend. Um, 20 years later, uh, I think that you, you reflect on that and you say, okay, where have we got to and, and are our operations working? Uh, from the point of view of a civilian, I, I feel like they are working. I feel like the, the operations that we are in are, are still important and are still uh, capable of deterring an attack that maybe not be the level of 9-11, but an attack in general. Yeah, I think, uh, it, yes, I, I would agree with you that it is, it is an extremely important, uh, um, important mission to stop and, and counter terrorism. Um, from my point of view, and this is something that we've been going through in the Army for a few years, right? The, the Army, uh, you know, over 20 years has learned to do this mission, but it's not necessarily like the, the, the fundamental core of what we were trained to do. Mm -hmm. So we've spent, you know, a long time learning how to do uh, stability and support operations, learning how to, to do counterintelligence operations, learning how to do tactical site exploitation, and being a part of that mechanism of, of counterterrorism and, and working in the intelligence community. Um, what we've had to start to actually shift back to is an emphasis on our core uh, ability to fight force on force. That's been a huge thing in the army over the past three years is like, okay, we've spent a, a generation of soldiers and, and service members, you know, doing FOB warfare, like fighting out of these bases that we established in the Middle East and in different places. We need to get back to learning how to fight force on force, tank on tank, to fight a near peer enemy. Um, so I think that um, the evolution, the, the natural evolution of, of the fight should probably start to shift back more towards the intelligence community. So the three letter agencies to do this, to the human intelligence pieces that do this, like we have to start to get to a point where, where we're stopping these things before they happen and focus on, on the, the national security aspect of this um, and, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean boots on the ground. We can do counterterrorism without having, you know, service members everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that's kind of the natural, that's where we want, that's where we should want to get to, right? Is that like, we don't need to have service members in these places because we have a working uh, partnership with the government, um, with that nation's police, with that nation's, you know, security forces so that they can kind of do this themselves because they, and we realize that it's in their best interests as well, right? So, I think, that, um, you know, this is this is not just an American concern. This should be a worldwide concern, right? Counterterrorism should be a worldwide effort. Nobody wants to be um, facing, you know, terrorists and right. be fear of, of, of those things. So is the mission important? Yes, absolutely. Um, do I think it need do I think it should be evolving um, to include lots of different aspects and not necessarily meaning troops everywhere we where we think that there's a threat? Um, yeah, I think that that is the, the most, the, the most uh, best case scenario of, of this thing, uh, of this effort going forward. Yeah, I would have to, I would have to agree with that. I, it's, when, when you asked the question, I had this moment, Sean, of being like, all right, how, how do I answer this question? Because it's honestly, the debate that I have with, you know, friends of mine who we, you know, throughout the military and in the intelligence community who have been, you know, this has defined our, you know, our professional careers um, of how much should we still, you know, continue to focus. Like we, you know, like Ryan said, we all agree that terrorism, you know, remains you know, a very critical issue, but how much more time do we need to be, you know, spending with, you know, these large bases and the boots on the ground and kind of all of those different aspects. And I think, 
you know, it, and it's something that I still confront on a regular basis, mm -hmm. you know, in, in my continuing work as well of, of, you know, how do we, I don't think though, what we have figured out is really well is how do we successfully draw our forces down or, or change our posture all that well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as, as Ryan's talking about the, you know, the rise of Russia and China and, and that near peer competition and state on state and, you know, that being the predominant enemy is certainly on the minds and, pri and policy priorities in Washington, mm -hmm. but on the same hand, and, and I'm probably, you know, I don't want to say scarred because that's not quite right, but I still kind of also think of like, okay, we did this drawdown in Iraq, you know, in 2010, 2011, and three years later, we ended up being in the bat in the same spot, you know, fighting the Islamic State. Yeah. And so that's, you know, and so thinking about that, while I agree it's a critical issue, it's probably not you know, at the forefront as it was 20 years ago, but we still really need to think about smart ways to, to have that handoff between shifting priorities so mm -hmm. we don't end up in another situation that, you know, we've been fighting in Iraq for the past, you know, six, seven years now. Right. Um, and That's us just saying like, oh, the Islamic State has gone back underground, like no big deal. If you don't have, as Ryan said, you know, the intelligence posture, the law enforcement posture, kind of all of those different elements working in concert and together, not only in the United States, but with our partners and allies, it, it's still going to continue to turn and bubble and, mm -hmm. and be an issue that, you know, that U.S. policymakers are going to have to confront and, right. and figure out how to confront. Yeah, I think um, just a, a real quick point, which I think is important to, to this, is that like you also have to recognize that that the presence of, of an outsider, the presence of U.S. troops or coalition forces, like perpetuate in in a sense, right, perpetuates this, right? You're you're kind of creating more enemies by your presence there by occupying these areas, right? You're you're creating resentment or anger or making it easier for people to be recruited into these terrorist organizations because you're you're an enemy that is right there. Um, and I think any American can can appreciate that if we thought about what, how we would feel against a foreign force in our country, right? So that's another part of this conversation which you you also have to to talk about. And that's, that's a pretty in-depth conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's a, that's another point that, that should be considered is, you know, what are the negative aspects of our, of having our forces boots on the ground in, in some of these areas? It's, it's very interesting. If you've seen the Vietnam uh, Ken Burns documentary, I've been talking a lot about it because I recently finished it, but it, it, that's that same idea that uh, we were creating a lot of our own problems because a lot of people were joining the Viet Cong because they were sick of us being in country. Um, so, you, you know, you're right. Like you, you, it, history again, and it sort of repeats itself of like, how many more enemies are we creating due to our uh, assistance, quote unquote, uh, you know, uh, in the, in country. And now is that helping or is it hurting? Um, you know, it, God, it, it's, it's such a difficult question to answer because as we said, it's like a, a double-edged sword. You want to be there because you want to deter the, the counter-terror or you want to counter-terrorism. Um, but are you also uh, creating a, a bigger a bigger problem? Um, which, you know, it, you know like we can answer that. It's like how what, you're weighing one against the other. Um, and I think with that, it also, I mean, I love the Ken Burns documentary. I thought it was fantastic. Um, but I think it, it's also, you also have to look at kind of each country and each situation as well. Um, you know, for example, you know, just thinking about the Islamic State, the U.S. presence in Iraq by that point was so low, you know, and then they moved into Syria and took advantage of a vacuum with the Civil mm -hmm. War and we weren't there. But, you know, I definitely take the point that, you know, 
U.S. presence or foreign presence can be in can be a factor that perpetuates the cycle. But I think there are also times of understanding the organization um, is also just as important as well. You know, whether it was Al Qaeda in Iraq or the Islamic State, you know, they also were able to leverage grievan local grievances against the Iraqi government. Um, within the Sunni population. So, you know, there's also this, and again, this could probably be an entire other I was going to say, that's, that, that's five different rabbit holes that we could dive into. And, and more than likely, we yeah. will in, in Generation 9-11, uh, as yeah. we sort of start to go over the timeline of the global war on terror in that, in that program. Exactly. And like, and so it's, it's interesting, because for us, as we, you know, define Al-Qaeda, or the Islamic State very specifically as a terrorist organization, you know, bringing on a scholar who can be like, you know, pulling it apart and is it, well, is it really a terrorist organization or is it more, or has it morphed into more of an insurgent organization? Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's in, you know, again, that's, you know, rabbit hole number 12 or, or whatever <laughs> we're talking about. But I think there's, understand you know being able to understand just as we have evolved the enemy has continued to evolve as well yeah. and yeah. understanding that will also help us you know and and our partners and allies in the long run in this fight as well I have to thank our Scuttlebutt audience for joining us for this lighthearted trip down memory lane. Uh, we, it's uh, it's an easy coffee hour here with the Scuttlebutt. Um, but if if you uh, have interest in what has been going on globally with the war on terror, um, continue to, to tune into the Scuttlebutt. Ch come and join us on Generation 9-11 because uh, I'm learning a lot just by listening to both of you talk today. I, I'm sure that our audience is going to learn a lot. And as we dive into this timeline uh, to understand the last 20 years, I think there's a lot of information in there that people won't know or won't understand about uh, where the US is, what we're doing, why are we there, um, what forced us to go there. Um, you know, you don't you don't necessarily think off the top of your head that we pulled out of Iraq. We were gone, we were, we had we were out and then the insurgency happened and we had to come back in. Um, so, th you know, there's these timeline moments that sort of like go, oh, I, I didn't understand that, that there was a need for us to go back. And, you know, what we were doing there uh, had an effect. It was a good thing. You know, we wanted to, to help the Iraqis. Um, so we're going to dive into all of this over the course of the whole year. Um, and, and I'm so happy that you both uh, joined us for this first episode. We brought up a lot of topics that I think uh, we will come back to. Um, and uh, I do want to end uh, on a light note uh, for our for our episode in in our scuttlebutt round. Have, if, if this comes to us from taskandpurpose.com, have you guys heard the story of Scoff the Duck? I had not. No. No. This I love this. Uh, so Scoff the Duck is a bright green stuffed animal who provides a splash of color and a touch of home for Air Force Captain Andrew Munoz, uh, formerly of the 494th Fighter Squadron and now Chief of Plans for the 335th uh, Fighter Squadron. Um, from his perch atop Munoz's F-15 instrument panel, Scoff became a hit among the members of the 494th Fighter Squadron. Scoff's origins lie in a, a tough moment for many military parents uh, saying goodbye to their young children as they deploy overseas. Well, when Munoz was leaving for his second deployment, um, to make things a little easier, he actually uh, took his daughter's duck with him so that uh, whenever they would do a video call, she would have something to associate. It would be a little bit more like, oh, I knew duck, duck was with me, now duck's with dad, um, which can make me cry immediately. Uh, but um, Munoz said, I didn't want my daughter to think I lived inside her phone. I took Scoff so that she could connect with me with something uh, she had possession of in reality. It was a, a crucial bonding experience for them. And like many pilots, Scoff got his nickname from his wingmen. In this case, the duck was named after the AA-10D heat-seeking missile, <laughs> an easy thing to name a duck, also known as a duck. That's what the missile is called. The phrase, don't scoff the duck, is often dropped uh, before every training sortie. I guess no pun intended, but they did make a patch that we'll throw up here on the screen of scoff the duck. Um, there's a really cute picture of, of uh, Munaz and his daughter holding the duck and then the duck in his uh, F-15 cockpit. Um, 
any memento uh, to take with you, I guess, uh, is something. Uh, but Scoff the Duck, I love it. it was, it's a, a really heart touching little story out of out of there. I so, love it. I want to, again, thank you both for coming on. Um, there's there's so much to dissect about this. And, uh, you know, Karen, I'd love to have you on Generation 9-11 to talk about the Sunni-Shia uh, rivalry, because there's that could be that could be many different episodes of just sort of understanding that part of the world. Mm -hmm. Anytime, mm -hmm. anytime. <laughs> and Ryan, your your experience and your stories coming out of Iraq and, and your long history with the army, um, that's gonna uh, help give context a lot, I, I believe, if, if you'd be willing to join us and talk about those. Absolutely, thank you for having me. Um, I think uh, if I can leave you with two closing thoughts, it's that 9-11 certainly changed the world. And number two is that there are, there are no easy answers. Mm -hmm. yeah. What we're, what we're talking about when it comes to the global war on terrorism. Thank you all for joining us. Click like, share, subscribe, uh, leave us some comments, send us an email. Uh, if you have questions or thoughts on what we discussed today, uh, we'd love to hear them. Um, and uh, we'll talk to you all next week. Thank you. Mm -hmm.